remind everybody uh, to my left is Dr. Val Preston, UCCDC, Dr. Van Mustajeki from UCCDC, Dr. Um, Kristen Miller from uh, DFO, Michael Raj, Dr. Michael Raj from CFIA in Sydney, and Dr. Bert Lay from CFIA in Colorado. Does anybody have a question to start off with? Sure, so uh, we just got a, starting a project, actually a genome BC project, um, to apply it to um, strawberry testing right now. So there's, there's been sort of, uh, last a few years ago, there was, there's a lot of strawberry plants that are grown in Canada that are then shipped to um, Florida, California, where they're then grown and, 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 uh, they, and harvested. Um, a few years ago, um, um, most of the plants that were shipped um, died, and it was due to um, uh, a virus disease, actually it was a complex between several different viruses. So the, the U.S. now has, has put um, some, some, some um, regulations or requirements on Canada that we need to test for, I think it's 11 or 12 different viruses. So that's all done right now um, by private labs um, using PCR, um, which is, again, quite time-consuming and, and laborious. We figure we can do that with a single NGS test for probably um, the same price or, or less, but also just to speed up the whole process. <laughs> expanded upon that too, too much yet. We haven't certainly looked at um, sequence variation in uh, the context of, of infections that, that we work with so far, but that is certainly a possibility um, to look at in the future. One thing I didn't, I didn't emphasize in my talk was that, um, well, A, we, we, we have 40, 40 markers, but it doesn't take 40 markers to differentiate, and I have, I have one slide on that, but we've done that across um, different studies, and it really takes somewhere between um, seven and 11 markers to do a good job to differentiate um, individuals in a in disease case <coughs> from latent infections. Um, and the second question was on, sorry. Epigenetics. Oh, epigenetics. Um, haven't, haven't gone there yet, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's a really good next step, but haven't gone there yet. Yeah. Um, can you do this pathogen analysis? Well, there, there's a lot of interest in culture-independent methods. Um, there are some uh, folks in our agency working on developing metagenomic uh, techniques so that you can recover the total bacterial DNA in a sample and look for pathogens. But as far as I can tell, I think for the foreseeable future, we still need to have an ISO, an actual live bacterial ISO at the end of the day. So our focus in our lab has been on using full genome sequencing to identify and characterize the actual colony isolates recovery. Thank you everybody for your great talks. I have a question for CFIA on the import of food. Since you're using non-conventional methods now to test for all these um, uh, potential
potential pathogens coming in from your organisms. <coughs> what kind of feedback or sort of pushback do you get from other, um, so from the countries that are exporting these goods? And is there some sort of a global um, standards <coughs> set up for this kind of work? Well, I think uh, Mike alluded to QA, and that's something that in our agency we've invested uh, considerable resources in developing a quality assurance system to ensure, to assure that we're using validated methods, and also to assure the trans uh, transparency of, uh, and auditability of everything that we do. But ultimately, as I mentioned earlier to, to the other lady, uh, you know, when, when we are analyzing colony isolates using whole genome sequencing analysis, I think those analyses are, are quite definitive. Genome sequence data is typically used when we used to validate traditional methods. We would, uh, in order to verify the authenticity of strains, we would sometimes have to have to have to provide whole genome sequence data from inside <coughs> those strains to demonstrate the authenticity. So, I think that kind of result, you know, with proper validation, quality assurance measures in the lab, it will be more and more acceptable. But I am <laughs> one of the things I didn't get a chance to present is. We are uh, involved in, a, in, in an international regulatory uh, genomics consortium where we're trying to develop best practices and get consensus internationally on, on the best practices for the application of bioinformatics and genomics. So hopefully that will go a long way towards smoothing the, the ground there. Maybe I can ask a question. I'm, I'm, I want to, all of you have talked a bit about uh, data integration and, and networks and Partners, I'm just wondering how, if, if, if you can look at each of your uh, specific uh, organizations uh, and how that uh, looks, what, that, what would that look like uh, in the future for, for this data to work for your, your organization if you're trying to do the human health side and plant health side of you know, safety? Uh, so I think in terms of the human side, and I think there's some potential for overlap From the human side, what's clear is that <clears throat> BC has some fairly powerful holdings of uh, the administrative data. So hospital visits, uh, we have a very rich data set on people's prescription drugs, medical visits, the cost of services, uh, where those services are required. And uh, to, it, it, right now, you have a ministry trying to figure out how you bring these massive data sets together so that you don't have to cut a data set every single time. Every single time you cut a data set, you, you increase the amount of workload tremendously. Um, the other thing is, in bringing together these very large data sets, uh, because there's so much granular data, you theoretically could identify people. So you have to have all of these safeguards to ensure privacy um, what's also clear is that if we're going to effectively link that kind of administrative data, we need to have a fairly robust ability to have the genomics data. And having the genomics data in a secure, scalable environment where you have the analytical infrastructure, the ability to bring data in from other sources so you can share it nationally and internationally, uh, analyze the data, but also analyze it across the food, animal, uh, uh, even fish. It'd be interesting to see, you know, we eat those fish and we enjoy our sushi, but do we actually have any uh, infections from that that we are suffering from? Anyways, I think that you really do have to have a very strategic approach to this. It has to be uh, governed, it has to be scalable, it has to be really thought through. Everyone's trying to get there, and the faster we can get there, I think the more effectively we can actually hang on uh, research, uh, research cohorts, create research cohorts, have collaborations with industry and with uh, science. If, um, so if we take it, sorry, can you, is it on? Yeah. Um, if we think about it just from the genomics data, we can look to our neighbors in the south and we can see that they've taken a diff very different approach than what we've done here in Canada. So for all the whole genome sequence data that's generated um, in the clinical labs or, or some of the food labs, um, that's not necessarily 
made public or shareable with one another. So I did mention some of the infrastructure to allow that sharing, but the network of networks did not yet exist. But if we look at our neighbors in the south, um, the um, US FDA and the CDC is releasing their data in real time. So part of the improvement in the data integration is actually change, a shift in the culture away from hoarding data to sharing data. Um, and I think that here in Canada, we're not quite there yet, but we certainly have seen examples where this has happened um, quite rapidly in the States um, with, the, with some of the, uh, the big federal agencies. I can say this has um, been extremely difficult in the area of um, quad animal health. Um, because there have been a lot of silos and a lot of a lot of controversy over the potential for transmission between cultured fish and wild fish, and so there are databases of, of information, um, health information that exists for aquaculture fish and um, fisheries and oceans is now beginning to release that data publicly and make it a public resource. Um, and, but wild fish data really hasn't been made as a public res resource, and. Um, I think in the future, with we, we're actually applying this technology, and I should say we're also doing that gen sequencing um, because we're very interested in the potential transmission dynamics, and that obviously is is, is the next step um, in order to better understand that. Um, but but having a common database where we actually can share what we observe in wild fish and what we observe in farm fish, um, both geographically and temporally, and, and etc., would be of, of a tremendous amount of value. But it, it's so politically pressurized right now, this whole this whole area, and there's such a fear of you know, what the public will do with um, this information or, or, or how it will be interpreted, that I think that that's really been a, 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 an obstacle in, in getting this data out in a, in a public kind of forum. In the, uh, so the plant health area, in particular the, like the movement to propagated plant material, we're, we're kind of lucky because there already is a framework in place, an international framework for that. So it's really, it's, it's layering um, these methods on top of what we already have. And it, it's, it's pretty well recognized for most countries that, that you know, um, this type of uh, methods from NGS or genomic data is, is really um, is the way to go. So there's already a buy-in from most of the research side of, to, to, to get this implemented. It's a matter of getting it up into, into something that's accepted at a regulatory level. So they're already, um, you know, several sub international trials comparing uh, different methods or you know using common methods um, to see whether we we get the same type of um, results. So there is already a sharing of data and a, a sharing of samples. Um, you know, there's uh, also sort of more of a talk of um, when you're talking about plants that are moving across borders is having uh, sort of a digital passport that's associated with the plant. So it can be done once in one area, and then if that methods that were, gen that were used to generate that data are accepted by the other countries, uh, we, it doesn't need to be repeated and can be, can be used. So there's, there's, there's that sort of a, a, a ultimate goal. Um, one of the problems we do have um, uh, with, uh, with, with, especially with movement of plant material is, is that with NGS we're finding um, a lot of new viruses. And, and when you find, if, uh, you know, if I'm in Canada and I, I find a new virus and I, if I was to publish that uh, today, um, it, could, it could set up trade barriers between countries that we trade with in those commodities. So, um, you know, just finding a virus is not necessarily finding a disease, and that's, that's a really important um, part that you have to first clarify. So you have to, um, uh, you, what you're finding is that a lot of people in a lot of countries were, were sitting on data and not sharing it because we're afraid of what's in there, and we're afraid of, you know, maybe we're the only ones that got it, and then and that might, might create a trade barrier. So, um, you know, we've been sort of, again, it's something that's been talked in the community about how to share that data in a, in a less threatening type of manner. Because we know we're probably sitting on the same data and we're looking at the same stuff that no one wants to share. And we're hindering ourselves, all of us, by not doing so. So that's, that's something that needs to be worked on. Well, at the risk of repeating what's been said, because I think there's a lot of uh, folks have touched on that, that key issue that, sharing data in the food safety arena. I think the, the food safety information network will go a long way towards promoting more sharing between federal and provincial partners in the uh, involvement in food pathogens. Um, but uh, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that the, the U.S. does have an excellent program in place called Genome Tracker, uh, where uh, uh, they do share, Natalie referred to that uh, program where they do share the data 
uh, and make it basically make it public. And, and there have been many very good examples of how having this, uh, this system in place has helped the, the, uh, the FDA pinpoint um, areas where there are, when there are food contamination events, pinpoint the contamination event to the level of the farm as opposed to, to an entire sector. And uh, so economically, I think this, this can be very advantageous for food producers if you can, instead of penalizing an entire sector, you can pinpoint it to the, the one area where there is a problem and address that uh, without the, 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 the full-scale sector being, being affected. We have to consider whether we want to set up a parallel system or should we join uh, with, the, with the FDA initiative, which is really an international initiative, it's not just FDA, but it's clearly it's FDA-led. But that's, I think, something that we need to discuss. Do we have our own Made in Canada parallel system, or do we put all our, 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 our uh, data together with, uh, with our, 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 you know, the U.S. and the FDA, which already has a well-established program? Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I spoke to uh, the fact that partnerships are one of the key factors to uh, supporting their initiative. And from what I can see, or the observation that I make is that the majority of what we're looking at is still controlled and or managed by governments and really research-based uh, projects. I'm wondering what hurdles we need to overcome to allow industry more involvement in, in managing pathogens globally. Um, again, it seems very much a government-controlled scenario now, and I feel like if we can get more industry involvement, we'll have some bigger advancements. And so I'd like to get your input on what you see as hurdles that we need to overcome. I think the first point is that if you look at everyone who's sitting up here, we all work for the government. And so I think that that really does represent um, some of the challenges, and that it does tend to be, um, tends to be government-centric at this point. I think that there is opportunities for innovation, particularly um, for partnerships to then leverage and, and go beyond what the government is <coughs> doing right now. And um, I think that there's still the base level of what our basic operations have to be, and then with respect to trying to do those improvements or those, um, you know, to do sort of system changes as opposed to just doing it at, a, at a, the individual government silo. Mm -hmm. Although I don't really have any concrete ideas of how to move that forward. I think part of the differential representation is not that government's the only ones doing um, health kind of research and looking at pathogen diagnostics, but we're the ones that are willing to be public about it. Um, and so there's a lot of industries who um, have their own in-house um, research programs, but they're not going to come in front of you today and say, oh, guess what, we found all of these things in our fish and we've got this new diagnostic for this. I mean, certainly they can do that to some degree, but, but I, I just don't think it's, it, it becomes as public um, as, as, as we can do uh, within the government. I, I know when we developed our program, there was, it was delayed and delayed and delayed in getting sign on for funding because the concern was that you're going to look at 46 different things and 26,000 fish in British Columbia and, and you're going to find lots of things and no other country is looking at that depth. So Canadian fish are going to look dirty and we don't like that. Um, and, and the industry was very, the aquaculture industry was very concerned with, with you know, how it would make their fish look you know, relative to the other countries who were looking at three or four things that were of important to, importance to them. So um, I, I just think it, it, I, it, you know, that government scientists and academic scientists are much freer to talk about what they're doing, but I think that industries are still doing this kind of work. Um, one of the things too I think is, uh, at least the type of work that we're doing is, is, is um, up until now, most of the testing, or if you wanted to do like a, a in-depth um, um, testing, it's just too expensive for, for a private country to, company to do it. It's just not economically viable to do it. With, with these new tools, I think that's really changing. And, and, and you know, one of the things we're seeing you know, in Canada right now, I, I, when I talk more about import and export of material, we're, we're now talking about developing a domestic certification program to make sure that um, uh, clean material is grown within Canada and is available to growers rather than having to import material from other countries that may potentially be infected or dirty. And, and these tools that we're talking about today are, are going to help make that possible because now it makes it economically viable for, for, for a testing company to do that as a service to the industry. 
Um, so one of the things that we're doing you know, right now, and this is again one of the, the GMBC project, is to try to transfer this technology to a private company. Um, and, and, and evaluate to see whether it's cost effective for them to do this. Um, if it is, then, then it really does open it up the, the possibility for other small testing labs to, to, to spring up to do this type of work, especially on a, on a domestic um, um, certification program, or, or even if it's, you know, for, for, for exports and imports as well. Right now, it's just two owners, but it's going to change. <laughs> So I guess my comment would be that um, what we need is, is a thought process that really thinks in terms of how to support um, our economic competitiveness. And from a policy perspective, how do we use some of the riches that we have invested in that are government assets? And, and the government assets include the data sets that we have. So it's how do we create the kind of partnerships that meaningfully bring together the research community, which uh, has its strengths, uh, the government and uh, private industry, so that you can actually um, develop these sectors more effectively. And clearly, what GOBC has been doing is, is trying to maneuver that space. What's clear is as we try to bring together these really complex, integrated components of information, that requires a really sophisticated integration of services and thought process. And, and I think that this group here has some of the connections, but ultimately it's about very, very uh, policies that are very strategic in terms of supporting economic development and science. Mm. stocks, we also have enhanced stocks because a lot of the fish that we have out swimming in the ocean and migrating are um, come out of our uh, salmon enhancement program. And in terms of trying to mitigate um, things, it's very, very difficult to do in, in wild fish by themselves. But if we can understand transmission points, if we can understand, um, you know, whether or not um, our culture systems, whether they be enhancement hatcheries or aquaculture, are, um, are increasing the, the prevalence or, or loads of specific infectious agents um, that, are, that are of concern, uh, then, then we have a way of, of targeting um, how to mitigate within those culture systems. Um, and so a large part of my program is, is really looking at the differences between cultured and wild fish and what are the mitigation points that we can use in the future because it's really very, very difficult to do in wild fish. The other thing that one can do though, if you can understand what diseases turn out to um, be common and, and, and potentially of importance to, to our wild fish, is we can start tracking the associations of those um, infectious and, infections and diseases with survival um, in the early marine environment, which is, a, which is a time point where there's a lot of mortality, and, and use this kind of data to predict um, what, what your escapement's gonna be, how, how, many, how much losses do you expect to be infection-based um, in a given year. And so uh, it provides some predictive capacity for management models to say how many fish do you think are gonna come back? Here is the state of those fish. And, and the other thing in my program is we're not only focused on disease, we're focused on other um, physiological stressors and, and the impacts of those. And all of those things, uh, markers for disease, um, um, markers for specific pathogens, and markers associated with very specific stressors are all being wrapped up into one tool, uh, which is using the Biomark platform, by the way, uh, combining post-transcriptome work and biological monitoring like of, of infectious agents to provide an overall health assessment. And that's really what's going to come into the management. How do we determine the health and fitness of the fish that we release from hatcheries and how they're doing when they're in the early marine environment as a way to predict um, what's going to come back and also how we mitigate things. The question for the federal scientists and the background is that uh, our friends in Ottawa, Genome Canada, are still negotiating with ISETS the agreement. One of the contentious 
point is whether co-funding from federal ministries should be accepted or not. And so how much do you depend on funding from organizations like Genome in Canada, uh, where you kind of get federal money that has to be leveraged um, in, in advancing uh, the, the science in your respective areas? And what would be kind of an impact if we would say, well, we're not really interested to work with you because we can't use your money uh, to leverage the funds that we need to leverage? Right now, um, we actually don't get, of course, funds directly from, from Genome Canada, but the incentive for, for federal scientists to, to participate in these projects is that they might be able to indirectly get postdocs and, and uh, grad students in their labs so that they get help and, you know, if they're working with a, a university collaborator, they can indirectly um, uh, benefit in, in this fashion. Um, the, uh, I found that in many of the initiatives that involve food safety, that involve uh, our area, CFIA is seen primarily, I think, as an end user rather than as an actual equal collaborative partner. So a lot of the projects that roll out um, tend to have CFIA as a, uh, as a potential end user, and so that's our stake in a, in a project and working with the project. So. I, I can say that the genome is seen as incredibly valuable partner in my program um, and and I personally have I believe I've been involved in, in Genome Canada submissions but there we actually are involved in one Genome Canada project, the COVO project. Um, and and really the ability to um, to work with Genome BC again in that format and to use co-funding with, with Genome BC within that um, program has allowed us to, to be real partners because in the early days um, you know to the grasp and the seagrass projects we, we were partners, but we were completely unfunded partners. So it was a very much of a one-way street. We provided fish and, and, and information, um, but we didn't participate um, in any meaningful way in the research, which wasn't uh, wasn't an ideal situation in, 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 in our um, view anyway. Um, being seen as a federal scientist as someone who only produce, um, um, provides fish to other people to do all the cool genomic stuff was, was not a good thing because we're a pretty geno big genomics group in ourselves. So um, I, I think that things have changed, and I think that with having these provincial, um, um, you know, genome organizations like Genome BC, um, I think that we can now contribute in a meaningful way, and, and it has it, it has really boosted the level of the genomics that that our federal department is able to, to do. Um, as Burton mentioned, we're not as well not allowed to accept uh, Genome Canada funding, but we are can accept uh, Genome BC funding, and we've just uh, actually working with David a lot uh, last year and, and just got uh, a project funding which is going to start very shortly and I, and I think it's going to be a very uh, um, a critical amount of funding um, because the, the industry that we deal with is, is, is kind of small and fragmented um, and, and has a limited a number of funds so being able to get uh, matched funds from, from Genome BC matched that with, with industry put in our time and labor into that we now get a critical amount of funding to actually do something yeah. and before that just wasn't so it's, I'd say it's critical for us. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Mary? I'd like to just follow up on uh, that question. At, at the very beginning in COP1, federal labs and the industry and everybody could get a direct So unfortunately then Genome you know, Canada kind of could not have uh, industry and federal government labs at the time. And one of the reasons was that is that even before Genome you know, Canada, there was the federal government genomics you know, program, which still exists. So my question is, in those departments like CFI, whatever, where you have got that genomics funding, how do you choose when well, how do you use those funds as distinct from using say genome BC? So you're referring to GRDI? Yeah, uh, on the, yeah GRDI and, and, was approved before Genome Canada. And that, that's been our, uh, our, our uh, uh, 
main source of, of um, funding for this type of genomics work uh, because our A-based funding is actually not very, uh, not, not very substantial. Um, and in fact, it, in the food safety area, I don't know about the mic in the plant world, but in the food safety area, CFIA is a relatively newcomer to the GRDI table. Uh, traditionally, in Health Canada, BHAC would have been first. And so uh, we've actually only, uh, you know, four years ago or so with the Food and Water Safety Project, and uh, now we, we have the AMR uh, project. And it is a substantial amount of funds and, and very, very much needed. We also have a departmental GRDI fund as well. Um, and that is uh, absolutely critical in our ability to, to do the, the research we, we're doing. It's, uh, you know, as you can imagine, sequencing is, is not cheap. It's, uh, you know, we, we um, uh, through our A base, we, I don't think we'd have enough funding to, to support the type of sequencing in our lab we've done in the last four years over 5,000 bacterial strains. So you can imagine the cost of that. We've very much depended on GRDI. And, and the uh, uh, Food Safety Modernization Fund, which is a different fund from the Treasury. Yeah, you mentioned the GRDI. Yeah, that's that was really the start for us. Which really, I think CFI was a became a member about five years ago. Um, pretty much all of the work that I described was funded through GRDI, um, and it's it was a, it was a, an amazing opportunity. Um, first of all, we were able to work with uh, multiple government departments on, on common goals. And, and share information and share tools and develop tools together. Um, it, it, to me, it, I could not have done it without it, to be honest. I think of GRDI being sort of like an insert discovery. Uh, it's, it's the, well, it's competitive yeah. funds and it provides a base level of support to, um, to genomic labs. Um, it's, so, it's a low level support, but, it's, but it still provides that base support. Um, and I mean, I've been funded with GRDI for 25 years. And, uh, but DFO is actually the, the really minor partner within the government departments. We get less money from GRDI than anything because it took a, a little bit longer for our department to really embrace genomic technologies. We're working very hard to try to level the playing field a little bit. Um, but no, it, it, it is really important and it's, it's been a co-funder of all, of all the Genome BC projects that we've been involved in and the Genome Canada project as well. So a uh, very important source of base funds. As a, as a corporate bureaucracy for us, it's been uh, mostly internal IT, uh, primarily. Obviously, genomics has to do with IT, and you know, I showed this integrated lab network, which really um, involves moving large data sets, uh, you know, from frontline labs to centralized processing areas, um, and and that's been one issue. And I suspect we're not the only ones with this issue: is the the, the infrastructure's capacity to to transmit large amounts of data. Um, without putting undue stress on the entire network. So uh, those are areas where we need to find solutions. Um, but the other thing, what we mentioned earlier, this whole uh, issue of sharing genomic information, we have to find a way to share uh, with our, our different research partners if we're going to get the, 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 the full, um, you know, if we can extract the full uh, benefit that we can get from genomics. I can just comment on the perspective of moving to genomics from the clinical perspective. So PulseNet Canada, that's, We've been sharing pulse field gel electrophoresis data through um, for over 15 years, and it's a very great system of uh, laboratories using the exact same method so that the data can be shared across sectors but also between provinces. Um, then PulseNet Canada is promoting the, tra the rapid transition to whole genome sequencing. They've actually distributed MySeqs or you know, desktop sequencers to all public health labs that are interested. 
but without any additional infrastructure. So we have the sequencers, but not necessarily the support to train the people to do the sequences. And the reagent cost for, for PFGE is relatively inexpensive, a couple dollars a sample, whereas the reagent cost for Illumina sequencing is, is a lot more than that. So I think that one of our challenges is going from having just, you know, having the sequencers dropped in our laps to actually be able to do this and operationalize it routinely when we just, we still have our routine clinical work to do. I, I would just add that um, health consumes about 42 44% of provincial budgets. And the laboratory sector, um, traditional laboratory sector, is about $720 million a year. And to manage care, physicians have 5,000 tests that they can choose from. So if you're going to uh, implement these newer tests, sure, you may be able to implement them some discrete surveillance pieces along the lines that we've discussed. But if you're going to implement genomics more broadly, then the questions become, okay, can you show that you have the incremental value and which tests can you get rid of? And our system isn't really integrated enough to properly evaluate these tools as delivered in the modern world. And, and yet, <coughs> the BC is well positioned to have that capacity because of some of the, the infrastructure that exists. So I think that there is a tremendous opportunity to try and uh, leverage uh, some of these partnerships to try and show the utility and how you could replace or make more effective prevention care and treatment decisions on the basis of this technology and show that it improves the health outcomes and improves the quality of care. In my experience, it, interestingly enough, one of the, the biggest issues in developing uh, new technologies and, and, uh, and, and genomic programs has actually been that managers don't like a lot of information to be really rapid. So when, when, when you're collecting, you know, we, we can produce information from thousands of individuals in a week. And, and you know, whereas, you know, previously, and, and, and an in-depth information. And so, um, it, it's taken a lot of discussion to get managers' minds around the fact that you're going to have, you know, 26,000 fish worth of, of, of information. Um, and, 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 you know, in, when, when we were going through the Cohen Commission inquiry and we had some questions addressing, you know, issues um, with um, salmon declines and, and, and we had some targeted research to say, okay, well, let's find out what we can find out about this. And we go in every week and say, okay, here's what we found out. And it was just like a whole bunch of different things because we can do things so rapidly. And and I, and I think that that you know managers and regulators aren't used to uh, getting huge streams of information um, to guide their um, to, to guide their decisions um, at the at the pace that genomics can provide it. And so in my in my program. My program is probably the most heavily regulated of any program in, D in DFO because the, the speed of the information. Um, and so I have to have meetings with, with managers um, in Ottawa every six weeks because they know that, uh, that everything changes in our lab every six weeks. We have so much more information and they want to keep on top of it because if we find anything that's novel or that might be of, of, of commercial or public interest, um, they want to know about it before it gets out anywhere else. So I think that it's interestingly enough, that's been um, actually an obstacle, but, but I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a bonus, but it's also um, not seen as bonus by all managers. Um, I think to the, you know, one, one of the um, things you have to always deal with, and especially when you're talking about, you know, an, an diagnostics lab, or especially like these small labs, is that um, diagnostics and international Regulators um, don't like change very much, and so you really need to you need to push it. Uh, and, and you and, and in order to push it, you have to go to quite a uh, uh, a length to 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 validate your data and really throw them the data and show like this actually is as good as this or it's better than that. To in order to convince them that this is going to be something that's going to be useful for them, um, you know. Um, Bird sort of mentioned, mentioned the infrastructure, and, and, and a lot of the labs that do this type of work, they're, they're not that well-funded labs. So when you talk about bringing an NGS into something like this, it's actually quite a disruptive technology because it needs a whole other system I and mean, a whole other way of looking at it. And it's where you get the funding to upgrade those labs. Are they willing to invest that? Because they got something that works. You know, and so you gotta convince them that you got something better. 
to make that investment to make that change. And that's not all I have. Um, I have a question that may be more for Mike than anyone else because uh, of your um, interaction with industry partners, small partners that are that are uh, participating in generating better crops and so forth. Um, how do you deal with the intellectual property uh, issues with these small companies? Because obviously, what uh, you know, that's some of the challenges we face as you know, BC is that we want the information to be public, and yet companies want intellectual property. So, I just thought your thoughts on how how you face that. Um, yeah, it, it hasn't been too difficult at, at the moment, but it, it, it is a problem because you know, we'd like to present, we have a whole um, uh, uh, repository of, of plants that are in our, 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 our import um, clean plant program. And these plants are owned by, by companies. They are just the holders of them in many cases. So when you want to go in and test them, um, you need to get permission. And, and often, really want to know. They don't want you to find something new because that causes a <coughs> kind of financial problem for them. Um, so there, it has to be done, um, you know, we, for the most part we say it's more of a research project um, that, we're, that we're dealing with um, and we try to respect their, their, their property. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'm not sure how much to say. It's, it's, it's not the, it's, there's no magic answer to that. <laughs> Any other questions? We've got uh, about a minute, two minutes and a half. Um, maybe just one more question I'll ask. Um, I think your point of now that uh, we're on the cusp, um, I'm curious, uh, maybe, maybe a couple of you on the panel, um, you know, what can GOBC do to catalyze something to get past that? trying hard, and <laughs> I think this uh, latest uh, recognition that we need to think about the economy and how you, what sectors of the economy that are going to be potentially there in biotechnology and scientific life science component is going to be important. And the reality is we need to invest in that, and, and I think some very strategic partnerships between government and industry critical and they're hard to forge because of the way our system has evolved. Mm -hmm. um, from the One Health perspective, I think that the, I mean, there's been a ton of support and I think most of the projects here could not exist without support from Genome BC. And I think cross-sectoral um, programs yeah. that could really support um, people who typically don't work together to work together um, and to, bring, to use innovation across multiple sectors um, would certainly be a benefit. I can actually say I've met quite a few people in these winter symposia who I've ended up collaborating with in, 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 in the future. Um, so um, I, I think that, that these kinds of forums where we have the panel discussion meetings really do foster um, a greater understanding of what other groups are doing. Especially, you know, when you're, I mean, I, I'm exposed to people in the fish world all the time, but, you know, being exposed to human health and, and agriculture and forestry and all of that, there's a lot of parallels in what we do and, and in the kinds of approaches we can take. And, and by having a forum like this and, and, and having enough time to have discussions with people, it's it's done a lot for me. And and um, I am actually working with the CFIA, actually, um, in, in another part of the country on, on the ag side uh, to develop, to try to help them develop a similar platform for agricultural use. And that kind of came through, you know, like like this.